Good morning, good afternoon, or even good evening, depending on where you are in the world. My name is Michael Carducci, and I want to welcome you to the latest in the No Fluff Just Stuff virtual webinar series. And this week, we are diving into event-driven spring. Now, spring has been around for quite some time, and uh, you know, a lot of what we as devs think about spring is you know the dependency injection framework that we get there we think of we we think of these restful web services but there's a whole lot more power on just beneath the surface and i am so grateful that we have a renowned expert on the topic mr craig walls craig welcome to the studio and thank you for taking the time to join us here well, thank you and i'd like to go ahead and answer a quick question that was asked All in right. the chat Yes, right, I do. I, I do have a planned trip to Disney World, as a matter of fact. So I got to get yeah. that vaccine first. But yeah, uh, after that, we are on the cusp and it is it is it is, it is so exciting uh, to, to see to see light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I, I the CDC just announced today that uh, that that there. Yeah, if you are fully vaccinated, by all means, travel. And that is exciting because. I know a lot of us are, uh, are are close or already in process of getting our vaccines and and uh, all all exciting stuff. And of course, the No Fluff Just Stuff tour is uh, you know is coming together. We've got a lot of dates in the fall. So if you have missed your friends, your colleagues, uh, the the No Fluff speakers and luminaries, and just that experience of of being together with a whole bunch of like minded, passionate individuals. That is coming. UberConf, of course, is scheduled to take place this fall. And we've got a series of hybrid events coming up starting in September. So definitely check that out. But you don't need to wait until September to get some quality no fluff, just stuff training and immersive learning. Uh, we have almost daily these live half day and full day instructor led workshops. We've got these webinars every other week. And, and there's so much more to take advantage of as well. All of the libraries that we've of content we've accumulated over the last 12 months. So definitely check all that out at nofluffjistup.com. But that's really just about enough from me because I am right in the middle of building an event driven system myself and looking forward to adding one more tool in my toolbox. So, Craig, please take it away. All right. I'm going to move a few things around on my screen just a moment and then I'll be ready to roll. Let's see if I can share my screen. Yes, that, that's the right button, thank you. All right. All right, so as uh, Michael uh, said, this is a, a, a talk on event-driven spring and I'm gonna try to get another thing out of the way, hold on. It's just my, uh, unfortunately, this this Zoom and, and Keynote don't get along with each other very well when they're both running at the same time. So I had to move a few things around just so I could see what I'm doing. Okay, there we go. Sorry about that. Yeah, so as Michael said, we're talking about event-driven spring. I'm Craig Walls, and uh, this is where you're welcome to email me if you have any questions. Um, I, after this is all over, I, I'll, I can't promise a timely response, but I'll do my best. And then also, if you want to follow me on Twitter, I... I tweet things there. And before we go any further, I do have to warn everybody. I, as, as everybody is at this point, probably you're, you're still at home. You're still working from home. You're still, you know, on a couch or somewhere. I'm, I have an office, I have a desk that I set up and all that. So I, I have a place that I'm comfortable to work from, but the problem is I still have, I'm still at home and I still have three dogs in the room. One of which uh, is kind of a butthead and demanding when she wants to go somewhere. And there's a, any moment she might uh, start annoying me. If I have to go on mute, I'm going to, I'm going to do that and tell her to be quiet, but hopefully that won't happen. Uh, I have some horrible geeky jokes on standby, just in case I need to fill some time. Awesome. Well, she is staring at me right now. Cause suddenly I started talking. I haven't spoken in probably two hours and suddenly I started talking. So she thinks maybe something's about to happen. Um, but yeah, she's, she's kind of a, jerk that way. Uh, anyhow, we'll move on. I just wanted to warn you, if I have to go on mute, I'm going to do that, uh, but I'll try. Hopefully that won't happen. All right. So what is event-driven? And there's a lot of ways you could describe event-driven uh, architecture, event-driven uh, development. And I'm just going to kind of go with this, this notion of events. They, they model the real world. And the, the basically what that means is um, 
they they deal in state and how things change in a business or in a in some sort of organization and how basically what happens is there's lots of small changes that take state take that take place to that state every day you know thousands of changes constantly changing state and uh, every time that one of these happens that means there's an event okay and so you might think of this as an order coming in. You might think of this as a house being sold. If you're in a real estate um, domain, you might think of this as a house going on the market. If this is a in a real estate domain, you might think of this as someone booking a flight. Um, you might, you know, these are or maybe somebody changing a flight or a flight has landed. Uh, you know, all these thing, things are a change in state where something was happening before. Now it it's different than it was a moment before. And so event-driven architecture, or what they call EDA for short, uh, it deals with patterns for handling those events and, and writing applications, writing code that deals with those events and possibly in the course of doing so, creating new events uh, um, as a kind of a side effect of the original event. And one of the coolest things about it is it achieves loose coupling. Now we've been dealing as spring developers, we've been thinking about loose coupling for years. Dependency injection uh, is one of the ways we deal with loose coupling. Um, but another, you know, there's other ways of dealing with it. And this is a much, much broader form of loose coupling in that we're not talking about taking one class and injecting it into another class and not really knowing who created it or, you know, how it's actually implemented, maybe because we injected it via an interface. But rather, it's one that spans multiple applications potentially. And now you could have event driven architectures that are all designed within a single application, but that's you're kind of losing some of the benefit when you do that. I like to think about event driven architectures in the context of microservices, where you have individual applications that are deployed along with each other, and they each have their own job to do. Okay. Now, one of the problems when I start saying this in the terms in the context of microservices is, well, there's microservices have have sort of wrongly been associated with something else, and I just want to clear that up before we go any further. Microservices are not necessarily REST services. Microservices are just a the idea is that they're focused. They know what they're doing. They have a job to do. They don't really do anything else. They're they're small in terms of the domain problem they're trying to solve. They are part of a greater domain, but they they are part. Of, they are small in terms of the problem that they're trying to solve. And that whether they they deal in REST or not, uh, they are focused on that. But in this case, microservices are not necessarily the same as a REST service. So when we're talking about an event-driven architecture, we're talking about services that sit there, microservices that sit there alongside each other within this greater application, and each has a job to do. And in, the, in this case, they're reacting to events and potentially firing off other events. Um, services don't know where those events came from. They don't care. I mean, this is in contrast to like a REST API where a REST API sort of, it may not know who made the call, but it knows it came over HTTP. It knows it's a get request or a post request. In this case, it's getting, it's getting an event. It's getting something and it has to deal with it. Where it came from does not know. If it has to generate a new event in the course of processing that, it doesn't know who's going to handle the next event in line. It has no idea. It's not sending it off to anyone specific. So, they don't know where they came from. They don't know where they go. And services, like I said, have one job, process that event, however they're supposed to do that. That's it. So if I'm gonna illustrate this, if I was to draw a picture of this, and it's just, this is such a, unfortunately, almost cliche type of diagram I've drawn, but I couldn't think of any other, any better way to catch it, to capture it is, you have some, some, uh, some service, that itself may produce events that are handled by yet another service that itself may produce events that are handled by another service. And this, this diagram could be more complicated in that it may have more services, but really at the end of the day, services produce and consume events. So 
the one we're going to talk about today, just for the sake of discussion, it's a pretty contrived example, I'll grant you. It's not something that I think that American Airlines or Hotels.com or anybody like that is going to steal from me and start working with because it's not quite that advanced. Um, it's somewhat contrived and somewhat slimmed down for the purposes of, of doing an example. Uh, but the idea is we're going to have something that produces trips. It produces those events. And so the idea is we're going to create a trip. That's an event. And then we're going to have something that processes that trip. And in the course of processing that trip, maybe what we do is something like uh, check inventory, maybe check, uh, you know, do go ahead and take payment or something like that. I don't know. But so just the concept of something that processes the trip. And in the course of doing that, the next thing it does is it passes off the itinerary. It doesn't necessarily deal with uh, the trip processor itself, doesn't deal with scheduling the trip as much as it deals with maybe the payment processing. And then the itinerary goes off. And it, it goes off as a separate event that's handled by an itinerary scheduler that schedules it. And you can imagine if you'd like here, uh, there might be other boxes on the screen here that might do other things like maybe send an email to the to the customer or, or something else. Uh, but just to keep it simple, we're just gonna go with this. And again, I, I acknowledge upfront, it's very contrived, uh, very simple, very, uh, very unlike what really may happen in the real world, but at the same time, at, at its underpinnings, the way that we fire off and handle events is very much the same as the real world, even if the domain I'm dealing with is rather simplistic. Okay, so when you're looking at a diagram like this, there's a lot of terms that you could throw around, and none of these are necessarily event-driven architecture official terms, but they're terms I use. They're terms that come from one of the spring projects called Spring Cloud Stream, which we're going to spend a little time with, and so I'm going to kind of kind of set the stage and settle what some of these terms are. Uh, to start off with, we have a source, and that's what they call it. They call it a source. Now, that source could be any number of things, and uh, it could be something that itself generates uh, an event. It could be something that maybe creates an event from some sort of external service. Uh, maybe maybe it does respond to an HTTP request. Maybe it triggers on a file dropping into a into a directory. Maybe it creates an event based on some message it received in a message broker. Maybe it creates an event based on an email that it has received. But regardless, there is something called a source that's sort of sitting at the very edge of this and generating events. Then those go off to one or more, and there could be several of these. Um, there really doesn't have to even be even one of those. It could just be zero of these, but the idea is there's a processor. And what a processor does is it takes in events, it handles them, but in the course of handling them, it produces output. It produces its own events. So when you think about what a source does, sources only produce output. Processors handle input and process output. And then they hand them off to something else, which may be another processor that does the same thing, or it may be a sync. And what a sync does, syncs take input, they take events, they process them, but then there's nowhere else for them to go, except for perhaps maybe somewhat like the source, they may actually leave the system at that point. They may go out somewhere else. Uh, for example, at the end of this itinerary scheduling, we may send an email to somebody, and that would be something where the, the event essentially leaves the system and goes on to someone else. Or maybe uh, we, you know, at this point we write it to a database, or maybe at this point uh, we send another HTTP request to somebody else uh, because that's the way we interact with them. But regardless, for the purposes of our design, for the purposes of this, we have three things. A source, which sits at the, the leading edge of the pipeline, a sync, which sits at the, sits at the trailing edge, those may or may not interact with external systems, and then a processors that sit in between and handle and fire off their own events. And then sitting between those are things called bindings. Now, there's a lot of different ways that Spring supports, and we're going to see a few of these, a lot of different ways it supports event-driven architecture. And among those, we're going to have uh, a variety of different ways you might you might implement binding. Some of them are going to be very explicit. Some of them are going to be in your face as to how this is being done. And then ultimately, some of them are just going to be sort of behind the scenes, making sure that the, the, the events get handled and, and passed off to the next uh, thing to handle them. But they the, you, you may not necessarily have to code to those things. So we're going to see a few different varieties here of, of how those work. Um, but Spring does, as I said, Spring offers several choices 
for event-driven architecture. Just a few of those options. And we're going to kind of skim over most of them, but we're going to dive into one of them in particular um, before we're done. Message-driven beans. Now, actually, before I go into message-driven beans, there's also a yet a, another a way you can do it. Um, Spring offers uh, template-oriented uh, management. So you can use templates for Rabbit, templates for JMS, templates for Kafka um, that you can use to fire off messages and use to handle messages. And if you've ever worked with the, the template-oriented messaging that Spring offers, it, it's nice to work with until you meet up with message-driven beans, and then it suddenly becomes less nice to work with. Uh, the templates uh, themselves, especially when it comes to handling uh, messages, and they, well, before, they, 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 it's kind of ugly. They block and you have to put maybe timeouts on them and stuff like that. It's just really nasty to work with. Um, message driven beans make it a lot easier. They make it where you can uh, annotate a method and say, I'm going to handle this kind of message. And so essentially the, 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 the method gets invoked when that message comes in. Now, I do want to be clear about one thing here. Uh, messages and events are technically quite different things, but events often are carried on messages. That's uh, they don't have to be, but oftentimes that is exactly how event-driven architectures are designed, is they're carried on the backs of messages that that pass through uh, different brokers. And so when I'm talking about message-driven beans here, I'm talking about something that has like maybe a Kafka listener annotation on it or a rabbit listener annotation on it, and it's just a method that's going to take that. And I'll show you an example of that here in a moment. But message-driven beans, they're nice. They're, they're very nice to work with. If you've ever played with them, uh, you, you start realizing really quick, this is a fairly easy model to work with. The only gotcha is, well, I'll save that. I have, I have another talk, another slide a little bit later where it talks about the gotchas, but you also have spring integration. Spring integration is awesome. Uh, spring integration has been around for a very long time. And over the course of it, its life, they've, they've done a variety of different ways of dealing with it. But at the end of the day, it all boils down to it implements the um, integration patterns book. Um, can't even remember Gregor Hope and I can't remember who else the authors were, but Addison Wesley's um, it, Enterprise Application Integration Book. It, it basically implements that book in, in, in a spring uh, approach. And in the old days, it, and it still supports this, but in the old days, it was XML-based definitions of, of, of integration pipelines. Then the, you started getting an annotation-oriented approach. And more recently, what's become nice is a more kind of a Java DSL approach. Uh, and I'm going to show you a little bit of that here in a minute as well. But Spring integration is really nice. Um, it tends to, not that it, it requires that you do this, but it tends to kind of lead, lead you toward putting your entire um, handling of events within a single application as opposed to breaking them apart. It is possible to break them apart. You just have to, within each one of those, start thinking about where's the next, where's the next place this is going to go. Uh, but Spring integration is really nice to work with. In fact, it is the underpinnings of everything I'm going to uh, talk about a little bit later. But then there's this project called Spring Cloud Stream. Now, I love Spring Cloud Stream. Spring Cloud Stream, uh, and it, it has it basically takes and embraces the the patterns that are exposed in Spring integration, and allows you to define those in a much more microservice, much more loose coupled, much more um, distributed fashion. It's really nice to work with. And that's what I'm going to spend my most of my time on today, uh, toward, especially toward the end. But um, it's good to know that Spring Cloud Stream itself is built on top of Spring integration and to some degree is built on top of even message-driven beans. Um, but yeah, it's, it's it basically Spring Cloud Stream takes what Spring integration offers and makes it better, makes it more loosely coupled, makes it even less coupled to the framework itself, to the underlying, um, um, uh, what's the word, uh, binders. Uh, it makes it even less coupled to those. And it's, it's really nice to work with. Now, once you've got your hands around, you know, or got your head around Spring Cloud Stream and you've created a few of these microservices, you realize that there's a certain amount of work you'd have to do. It's not a lot of work, but there's a certain amount of work you have to do to sort of tie these things together. So you've created all these services, now you have to tell them how they talk to each other. And, and you're gonna see that as we start working through some of the examples in a moment, you're gonna see how that works. But 
there's yet another project that has built on top of Spring Cloud Stream. I mean, you start seeing the stack build up. This, this other project is called Spring Cloud Dataflow. And what Spring Cloud Dataflow does, it does a couple of things. It does more than just Spring Cloud Stream. It also works with another project called um, Spring Cloud Task, which itself is built on top of Spring Batch. But we're not going to talk about that today. Spring, as far as Spring Cloud Stream and event-driven Spring works, Spring Cloud Dataflow builds on top of Spring Cloud Stream and takes takes away the um, the necessity to define kind of how things get flowed around within each microservice, and they allow you to kind of bind these things together um, in, in a runtime. So whereas Spring Cloud Stream, each application is its own application, runs independent of each other. Spring Cloud Dataflow, that's still true, but Spring Cloud Dataflow is the runtime in which all that happens. And it is aware of each one of those individual applications, each one of those individual microservices, and it's able to decide how these things are wired together rather than leave it up to them to decide how they should be wired together. And then there's, it's worth mentioning, Spring Cloud Function. Now, I'm not going to spend a great deal of time on Spring Cloud Function, ex except for the fact that you're going to see some Spring Cloud Function code without me even intending to show it to you. Because what happened is with Spring Cloud Stream, um, several years ago when it first when the project first started it was a very annotation oriented approach to development you would annotate your um, your beans as being either a source a processor or a sink and it required you to kind of define which one each one of those are by by, by using annotations but starting with more recent versions of spring cloud stream it's built on top of spring cloud function such that you can basically use the exact same programming model you would use with spring cloud function and these things as a consequence these things could well, they don't have to but they could run in a place like aws lambda they could run in a place like um uh, you know, Google's uh, function, Google Cloud's function um, hosting. I mean, you could host these pretty much anywhere you can host uh, any sort of what they call serverless uh, applications. And um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm not going to actually run a demo in AWS Lambda or anything today, um, just because I'm, I'm always a little hesitant to do that kind of thing. And especially when the, when the time is short um, to kind of interact with a cloud environment. Uh, but I'm going to run everything locally today. Just know when we get around to that, and I'll point it out again when we get there, that the code that I'm showing you is essentially Spring Cloud Function code. I'm just happy to be running it locally is all. Okay. Uh, so let's see some code. Speaking of that, uh, message-driven beans. Well, they look kind of like this. Now, I'm picking on Rabbit. Uh, just because I have to pick on something. And while Kafka is great and awesome, I got to be honest, I'm still kind of old. So I haven't really caught up to the Kafka world yet. I've, I've written some code in, that interacts with Kafka. And at the end of the day, to be honest with you, the code that I would write wouldn't be dramatically different than the Rabbit code I'm writing anyway. Uh, it's just I feel more comfortable running a Rabbit server in a Docker container on my machine than I do Kafka is, is all it really boils down to. Uh, but regardless... Um, here we have a rabbit listener. It's listening for a queue called trips, and it's going to send anything that's returned to a, another queue called itineraries. In the middle of that, this, 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 this method is going to process that somehow or other, but in the, it, along the way, it's going to take a trip. It's going to process it, and it's going to return an itinerary. The code that's under that, that, that comment there really doesn't matter. It, it doesn't matter at all. Um, I mean, that's up to you. You can, you know, whatever business logic is required to, to deal with processing a trip, that's what you're going to, the code you're going to write. Um, in, in the example, I'll show you a little bit later, all I'm going to be doing is just logging the fact I got it and how we process it's a separate issue. Um, but regardless, as you can see, if you just sort of kind of squint your eyes hard enough that you don't really see those annotations, what you're looking at is just a method that takes a trip processes it somehow or other, and returns an itinerary. That's it. What makes it message-driven are those annotations. The rabbit listener takes a, a event, it takes a message from the trips queue, and then when it returns an itinerary, it publishes a new one to the itineraries queue. That's it. Likewise, down at the bottom, that's a simpler one. That one does not have any sort of output. It's essentially, it's a sync. And so it's going to take things from the itineraries uh, queue and process them. And that's it. Uh, so it seems really simple. The only thing that's really, I don't care for this much is it does have an annotation called rabbit listener. I'm, I, I'm aware 
that I'm dealing with Rabbit. And if I wanted to change this code to work with Kafka, I would have to go everywhere I'm using Rabbit Listener and change it to Kafka Listener. And it would just, you know, it's not the worst thing in the world, but it's just a little bit too obvious. It's a little too coupled to the underlying binding. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's okay, but it's not what I would like to do. So message-driven beans, they can they can work with reactive code. They can you can instead of in the case, examples I'm sharing, I'm just dealing with trips and itineraries, uh, but they could be fluxes of trips and fluxes of itineraries if you'd rather write uh, code against Project Reactor and use a reactive coding model. Um, ultimately, the queue watching is handled by the framework. You're not having to write like you would with a template where you're having to sit there and and request messages and just wait for them to show up. No, all that's handled under the covers by the framework. You just annotate your beans as saying, I want to, I'm going to be a listener for this queue and I'm going to handle those things. You annotate your, I guess your method more than anything. I'm going to handle those things. Um, there's no clear way. It's not like it's impossible, but there's no obvious way to break processing in distinct, into distinct operations. It would be very easy for you to handle a, um, a message coming in for a trip and do, do all the work yourself in that one method. Um, uh, there's no, it's, it's not that it's impossible to break things apart. It's just no clear way to break things into distinct operations. It's not necessarily encouraged. And I, in fact, in my history, I have written lots of code. Uh, handling uh, messages using things like Rabbit Listener and Kafka Listener, and before that JMS Listener, where I ended up having a method that either itself was rather long or called out to other methods, effectively all within the same JVM. Uh, and so, no clear option for breaking this apart. Although that send to at the end that seemed to be kind of your clue that you could send it to somebody else for for further processing. Uh, it is coupled to a message broker. Um, basically, I'm 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 choosing Rabbit. Uh, and I'm, I'm choosing Rabbit both in my, uh, let's go back to that slide. I'm choosing Rabbit both in my handle message for trips and in my handle message for itineraries. These two bits of code could be in completely different applications. In fact, they probably would be in completely different applications, but I'm choosing Rabbit. I'm making that choice to use Rabbit because I chose Rabbit Listener, and therefore both consumer and the producer must agree on the broker. Um, at the end of the day, though, you have support for JMS, RabbitMQ, or Kafka, and there's a few other options out there as well, but those are kind of the three big ones, and, and nobody, nobody does JMS anymore, let's be honest. Um, okay, moving on. Uh, Spring integration. Now, Spring integration, again... Uh, it's it's a lived a while. It's it, it's done things a lot of different ways. There's been the XML approach. There has been a the annotation uh, approach. But what I'm showing you here, it's a little bit messy to look at in a slide. I got to tell you that. In my IDE, it looks a little less messy. But um, Spring integration um, has a Java DSL approach that is actually quite nice to work with. Um, and essentially, what it's saying in this case is, I am going to hit define a bean of type integration flow. And the integration flow is going to do a few things. And what I'm doing here to start with is if you look at that from line about halfway down, I am going to be listening for a message from the trips queue using an AMQB, AMQP message source. And then I'm going to do something with it. That's what the transform is doing. And so transform is essentially taking the trip, processing it, and then whatever is returned from the processing of that trip I'm going to handle that by sending it back out on the itineraries queue using an outbound gateway. Now, typically, if you've ever worked with Spring integration before or you've seen any examples before, they don't typically show them like this. This, is, this was written specifically uh, with the idea that I'm going to take some, a message from somewhere, process it, and send a new one out to someone else, a new event for someone else to handle. Uh, and therefore, it's rather short. It's rather brief. I have the input side, which is the from line. I have the output, which is the handle bit. And then in the middle is how I'm processing this. Um, usually, when you see spring integration flows, they're all within the same JVM. They're all just one big, long um, integration flow uh, running. And so it's not necessarily, I mean, nothing wrong with that. It's just it's not following that that. Uh, breakdown of that microservice approach to breaking these things down where things could run in different uh, environments. Now, I picked on AMQP message source and AMQP outbound gateway, which if you don't know what AMQP is, that's essentially for, you know, it's, it's all but synonymous with rabbit. So um, just imagine that says rabbit message source, if you'd like to here, you could pick other sources as well, including Kafka, including JMS, including email, including 
uh, you know, HTTP, including file system. You can watch a file system if you want. Uh, there's a lot of different things you could do here. Uh, I'm just, in fact, they could be different sources. You could take a message in on AMQP and then write it out to a file system using a different outbound. So um, typically, again, those, these are all rather large in nature, but because I'm breaking this, the idea here is I'm breaking this into individual microservices. I have it rather simple. The flow is really, really simple. It has where things are coming from, where things are going to, and in the middle, what we're going to do with them. And that's it. Okay. And what's not shown here is actually behind that process method. That process method is where I, I'm actually doing something with the trip. I'm processing it in some way. So again, Spring Iteration supports reactive programming with Flux and whatnot. Uh, the resource can be split into distinct operations. I mean, the processing can be split into distinct operations. More notably, it can be split into distinct applications, distinct microservices. And it is somewhat loosely coupled to the message broker in that I'm not necessarily dealing with the message broker itself, but in a way I still kind of am. Uh, I still do know I'm dealing with AMQP or I'm dealing with whoever's behind it. But the, the, the last line there pretty much sums it up. They're not necessarily sourced or destined for a message broker. They could be sourced from email or, or sourced from HTTP or destined to uh, go out to a database. They, there's a lot of different ways you could do this and Spring Integration supports all those uh, out of the box. And of course, you could always also create your own which is kind of a, a hallmark of, of almost all the Spring projects out there is if you don't like what comes out of the box, build your own. We, we provide you the interfaces and the ability to do that. Just build your own if you don't like what we offer out of the box. But then building on top of Spring integration, we have Spring Cloud Stream. And what Spring Cloud Stream does is, is a little different. Here we've declared a bean of type function. Notice that's Java util dot whatever function. That's, that's it's just part of Java. It's not even something Spring's defined. It's a type of, it's a bean of type function that has an input of trip, uh, trip booking and an output of itinerary. And of course, along the way, we're going to return this Lambda that takes a trip and returns the itinerary. Somewhere in the between, we're going to do some processing of that trip. Uh, and how that's processed, again, is up to your business logic. It could be processing the payment or whatever you need to do to process that trip. But in the end, we're gonna publish out an itinerary. Now, what's really cool about the, that first box up there is that is identical, exactly the same code you would write if you were writing this using Spring Cloud Function and publishing it to AWS Lambda. That is exactly how you would write the same code. What makes this a Spring Cloud Stream um, function is that that bottom box, we're telling it where things are going and where, or where they're coming from, where the trip is coming from, and where the itinerary is going to, all in configuration. Now, this configuration, the way I've written it, is when we see the running example in a moment, is in your typical application.yaml file, but it could be from any source of properties. It could come from, um, you know, environment variables. It could come from uh, JVM system arguments. It could come from an external file. It could come from Spring Cloud Config Server. There's a lot of different places that could come from. I'm just doing it within the application itself. And what I'm saying here is process trip. Notice that that name there, the under bindings, process trip is the same name as the bean. So the bean is given a name that is the same as the method that, that, the, that defines the bean. Unless you tell it otherwise, by default, it is going to use that same method name. So the name of the method that defines the bean is called process trip. Therefore, the bean name is process trip. Therefore, in the bindings, the first part of that binding name is process trip. The second part of that is the direction it's going in. Is it coming in or is it going out? And then there's an index. And the index basically means, uh, in generally it's zero, uh, but it is possible. Uh, it is possible to write more interesting uh, stream processing where things could come in from multiple uh, sources and things could go out through multiple uh, directions. And that involves working with tuples and all sorts of fun things like that. Your function would still be the same, but instead of returning a trip booking, or I'm sorry, returning a, an itinerary or taking in a trip booking, it might take a tuple of those things. So it can take, it could bring in multiple things. And the idea here is if you did have an index that was one, then the tu tuple, the, sec the second item or the one item, I guess, in the tuple is the one that would go out on the index one and the zeroth item would go out on the index zero or vice versa if it's coming in, uh, it would be the same idea. So just kind of sum that up again. The bean name 
the bean that defines the function bean is going to be that first part. The direction is the second part. And then the index, if you're using it, if you're using tuples to, to, to take in multiple inputs and multiple, or return multiple outputs, that's going to be uh, that, that last part. But typically it's zero. Typically you won't be using that that often. Oops, I meant to actually spend a little bit more time on that slide. Hold on. There we go. Well, nope, wrong slide. Sorry about that. There we go. Maybe this will be it. There we go. Okay. So once we've defined, okay, process trip, how's it, how's the stuff coming in and process trip, how's it going out? We've said destination and we're saying the stuff that's coming in is going to come from the trips queue. The stuff that's going out, is going to go out on the itineraries queue. And then we have a group that's associated with that. It's essentially kind of a name spacing. So if you have multiple uh, trips or multiple itineraries queues, the, the Starport 75 or Starport 75 here name is what kind of gives it more of a namespace around that queue. So we know that we're dealing with that one versus somebody else's trips or itineraries queue. And uh, so it's essentially what what group supports it or, or provides as a sort of name spacing. Um, so little uh, little trivia that you can, I'll, I'll go ahead and put in to, into this. You can put your answers in the queue if you'd like. Uh, see if anybody knows what star, why I chose Starport 75. Uh, but with that, I'll move on though. I won't go into it any further though. If you can identify what Starport 75 is, that would be awesome. All right, so schedule itinerary. This is the, the reason I'm cho showing you this. It's really not much different than the previous one. The only difference is it's not a function, it's a consumer. Consumers take input, but they don't produce output. So in this case, I'm only taking an itinerary and I'm doing something with it. So essentially this is a sync is all this is. So we have here, uh, the bindings are essentially the same. Schedule itinerary in index zero. We're gonna take stuff from the itineraries, the Starport 75 itineraries, and we're going to um, process that. And yes, Richard, Starport 75 is, or Starport 75 more accurately is the unofficial nickname for Space Mountain in Disney World, uh, opened in 1975. Cool, glad, glad somebody got that. All right, so Spring Cloud Stream, processing easily split into distinct operations. In fact, it's kind of, the, it's kind of hard not to, to some degree. Um, the message broker is the binding, but you don't notice that none of this code, let me go back to the slide again. None of this code says that I'm dealing with Rabbit or Kafka. None of it does. It doesn't know. The me there is a message broker, yes, but it's the binding underneath. It's not in the code itself. Ultimately, what that means is the library I choose to add to my build will determine whether I'm dealing with Kafka or Rabbit, but the code has no idea. If I wanted to switch from Rabbit to Kafka, all I would have to do literally is change a dependency in my build and rebuild it. And suddenly I'm using a new message broker binding. And again, events are not necessarily sourced from a message broker. Um, they, are, they travel along a message broker within the flow, but the original source and the ultimate sync if the, if they leave the flow and go somewhere else or come from somewhere else that could be anything i could write a i could write a source that pulls from HTT, handles http requests and produces events i could i could have one that looks at an email uh, box an inbox and produces events i could have one write out to an inbox or i'm sorry to i guess to an outbox write out a, an email if i want to or write to the file system if i want to is in my sync i mean there's nothing about it that says i can't do that what's also important to understand even though i'm not going to really dive into it especially given the time we have i'm not going to dive into it in any great detail spring cloud stream also has a very very rich library of pre-built they cut there, there's a variation, there's starters, and there's also some applications. The idea that there's some that, that handle common problems. There, that Like if you do want to read from an email box, you don't have to write that code. We, prov we can provide you with that piece. And then all you have to do is sort of just include it in with the rest of your flow. Uh, so there's already uh, stuff baked in for a lot of common uh, uses. I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but before we do that, I just want to show you a running application. I want us to show you something that really runs. And uh, to do that, I need to move some, some windows around. Bear with me. There we go. I couldn't even get to the top of this to move it around because I had other things in the way. And, I, and 
I, I realize you may not be able to, it may be a little small on the, on the left-hand side. On, when I pull the code up, I'll zoom in as necessary. Uh, so, so here is, let's start off with a, I've got four different projects. Trip domain really is just defines a couple of domain types, itinerary and trip booking. We won't worry too much about the details of those. You can kind of infer what those look like based on what I show you in the others. But I do have one called trip source. And what trip source does is it's just a regular Spring Boot app. It actually has a lot of code in it right here, but most of that code is, is the purpose of that code is to generate uh, random trips. Uh, the bulk of it is just to generate random trips. The main bit of code is this one that's right here between line 42 and 52, where I have a bean of type supplier. Supplier is the opposite of consumer. It produces output, but it doesn't take any input. So I've got this supplier that's randomly generating trips trip objects and our trip booking objects and it returns those and by the very nature of how spring cloud stream works by just simply declaring this bean it is going to every one second it's going to generate a trip that's configurable you can tell it otherwise you know how often you want to do it but by default every one second it's going to make an invocation to this lambda which is going to ultimately generate a trip and return it now where's that trip going to go well, that trip is going to go to the uh, trips queue namespace to starport 75. Okay, that's it. So I'm going to go ahead and not run that right now because if I run it right now and then come back and start the others later, the others will have to catch up because it's going to just keep producing trips every one second. I'll wait a moment before I start it up. Uh, trip processor. Now, trip processor is very similar to what you saw in the slides. Uh, again, very much. Um, I'm not even sure why I still have this atomic integer here. I was using it for another example and I decided against using that example, I think is all it comes down to. So ignore that. Uh, the main thing is here at the bottom, we have a bean of type, um, it's a type function that takes a trip booking, returns an itinerary, it's called process trip. And it's simply the way it's gonna process the trip is simply by logging it. You could imagine here that maybe we're actually taking payment. We're actually processing the payment, uh, the card number and making sure that it's valid and, and that they have the funds to pay for their trip. And then maybe that's what we're doing here. Maybe there's other processing going here, but for now we're just gonna log it. And then we're gonna return the itinerary from that trip. And that's gonna go out. Where's it gonna go? Well. It's going to come in, the trip is going to come in on the trip's destination from Starport 75, which is exactly where it went out from our, um, our, our trip source. But then we're going to send this out to Starport 75 itineraries, okay? And then finally, we have an itinerary scheduler, which, again, doesn't do anything exciting here. But you could imagine, if you will, that instead of just logging it, what it does is maybe it writes it to somebody's calendar or it sends them an email or, or writes it to a database or something. It, it deal, maybe deals with some you know, airlines uh, booking system and, and tells them, hey, this trip should be scheduled now. You know, Go for it. Uh, but for now, just to keep things focused on what Spring Cloud Stream does, I decided to only just log the results and not deal with the intricacies of booking travel. So there you go. It's just a bean of type consumer. So you have three types of beans you can work with here. You have, uh, you have consumers, which take input but produce no output. You have, pro you have uh, functions, which are essentially processors, take input and produce output. And then you have, um, I'm totally blinking right now. Uh, you have suppliers, which produce output but take no input. Now, where is this one gonna go? If you are, well, if you haven't guessed already, it's not gonna go anywhere. Whoops, I opened the wrong one. Where is it at? There it is. It's not going to go anywhere because I don't have an out defined, but I do have an in defined that says it's going to uh, pull pull its itineraries from Starport 75 itineraries. Cool. So let's go ahead and start that up. And I tell you what, I'm going to start all, all three of these at once. And it's going to be a little hard to follow because it's going to tend to, I think my ID is going to tend to want to focus on one of the logs for these. Um, but we'll see. Okay, it's all slowly starting up. And let's just go off to... Yeah, scheduling itinerary. So this is the sync. You can see it logging down there and it's saying scheduling itinerary and it's you know different trips to Mars and Pluto and Neptune and things like that. And for different uh, starting and ending dates. If I were to click on over 
I can see the trip processor. You can see this is just processing the payment card. That's all it's doing. It's getting whatever the random payment uh, card is. I think I only have two that it can choose from. Incidentally, those are not valid credit card numbers, but they do valid pass the, the LUN check. So they, they're valid in the sense that they, they are sort of like credit cards, but I doubt you could buy anything with them. And then uh, trip source, well, it's just generating trips and sending them off. So it's logging that every time it does it. And that's it. That's, that's how I tied this all together. The one thing that I need to point out one more time before we go on is notice how all these sort of just know, not necessarily what application they came from, but they at least know their queue. They know exactly where they're pulling their, their stuff from, and they also know where they're going to be publishing it to. And I, I point that out simply because that's kind of important to understand as I move on. And to do that, I'll click this button. There we go. We're going to talk a little bit about Spring Cloud Dataflow. I just don't have the time to go into it in any great detail or even run it for that matter. Uh, but Spring Cloud Dataflow builds on top of Spring Cloud Stream and Spring Cloud Task, specifically with regard to Spring Cloud Stream. It provides number of out-of-the-box sources, processors, and syncs, which are themselves Spring Cloud Stream applications, already predefined for common uses. So if you look at this list, I'm not going to go over the list in detail, but you see all sorts of places where events could be sourced. They could be sourced from HTTP. They could be sourced from the file system. They could be sourced from email. They could be sourced from S3. And likewise, syncs could go out to pretty much, it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but there's a lot of the uh, similar, some common elements under syncs as well as sources. Um, in fact, I'm not even confident that this is the complete and correct list. There's probably a few I missed along the way because I'm looking at a few of those and wondering why there's not one in the other one. So I may have uh, missed a few things when I created these lists. And then there's a lot of common processors for doing things like splitting into multiple, uh, you know, having messages go multiple paths. So maybe you take the payment processing and send it one direction and you send the trip processing in a different direction. And then later you can bring those back together, uh, for example. And there's other ones that you can use uh, like Groovy or Python. Um, well, actually, I don't know if the, yeah, Groovy or Python scripting uh, to kind of script these. And so you can write your processor where you have a little bit of custom logic, but it's, it's really you know, like a small script or something that, that does the processing as opposed to writing a whole bit of Java code at by hand. So you have some options there. Uh, but ultimately, when you're defining Spring Cloud Dataflow, you define them in two ways, either using DSL. And so this is an, a stupid example, but it basically listens for post requests on port 9000. It takes whatever it gets and transforms them. Um, and using an expression called hello world. So basically, this example is really stupid. All it does is take whatever it comes in and just transforms any event into the string hello world. That's all it does. And then finally, it logs it. And if you look at this, it's using those pipe delimiters in between. That's very similar to how you might use piping if you're on a, like a Unix system. It, you know, this thing takes what it gets and pipes it to transform, which takes what it returns and pipes it to log. And that's, it's just this little DSL you can use to define your streams. And of course, I'm showing the out of the box, out box HTTP transform and log components here, but you could also plug in your own components. And the way you do that is you ultimately just write Spring Cloud Stream applications. The way I showed you before the example, you take those exact same kind of a concepts, you register them with Spring Cloud Dataflow, and then you can string them along like this in the DSL as well. You can also, there is a UI for it. Now, the UI is, the dashboard's a little bit uh, constrained. I mean, the, if you can't read that, that's okay. Just understand that what you can do is you can literally draw lines between your components and kind of zoom in a little bit on it. You could do all sorts of things like take time, log it, time, transform it, and then log it, time, transform it a different way, and then log it. Um, you can de basically define all your, your flows graphically if you prefer to do that. What's really nice about using the dashboard is the dashboard lets you work either way. If you want to use DSL, use DSL. If you want to draw a picture, draw a picture. And, and no matter where you're editing it, it goes back and forth. So if you change something in the picture, the DSL changes. If you change the DSL, the picture changes. And it's really nice working in the dashboard that way. But ultimately, Spring Cloud Dataflow is a runtime. It knows about your individual applications and your applications don't need to necessarily tell anybody where their output's gonna go. That is essentially those lines you see in this picture or it's the pipes you saw in the uh, DSL example is that those are saying where they should go next. And so Spring Cloud Dataflow 
handles that that in and out uh, definition for you. So your applications only have to focus on what they're supposed to do, not where things come from or where they're going next. So easily split into multiple, into distinct operations, just like Spring Cloud data flow, I'm sorry, it's just like Spring Cloud Stream, the message broker is the binding. The events are not necessarily sourced from a message broker, even though the message broker is underneath. And it is a platform, not a framework, it's a platform on which you can build the build and deploy event-driven microservices. And I am out of slides. I am almost out of time, sadly. I went a lot longer than I thought I would, honestly. Uh, but before I go on and open it up for some more general QA, and I hope uh, Carducci can help me with that. Um, thank you. Of course. Uh, thank you. And uh, check out my books. Uh, just as a FYI, uh, Spring in Action 6, I am desperately trying to finish it. I, I, I'm very nearly done. I mean, it's one of those things if I had about two days of focus, I could probably wrap it up. And this, the same is true with the uh, Build Talking Ask My Alexa skill book. I'm working on that. That's, that's even closer to being done, probably. I just... Yeah, it's, it's hard to find focus these days, uh, but I'm going to try to do that. Um, but thank you very much. Check them out. And I'll take some questions now with Carducci's help. Yeah. So uh, two things. One is feel free to, uh, uh, to come off mute and ask directly. Otherwise, if you're not comfortable with your voice or, or whatever showing up in the recording of the, of the webinar, uh, go ahead and ask in chat and we'll watch here for a moment. But uh, while we're waiting, Craig, are you uh, anticipating, are you going to be, well, let me ask you this. Do you have any, any workshops coming up on the, uh, on, the, on the virtual workshop series? It's funny you should mention that because I think it's later this month. I, I don't know the date, but sometime later this month, I'm actually doing a workshop on event-driven spring. I'm going to go into a lot more detail into all the various things that I mostly glossed over this time around. Oh, how about that? That is Thursday, April 22nd, 11 a.m. Eastern, 8 a.m. Pacific. That's Earth Day, isn't it? No, no. Or is it Friday that's Earth Day? I have no idea. I've lost all concept of time and, and holidays and everything else. Every day is the same as the last. I am, uh, I've, been, I've been in Groundhog Day. Oh, for at least that's Earth Day. Months. That is Earth Day. But, uh, but do check that out. Uh, that, that is half day, half day training, diving a lot deeper into this topic. Uh, but we do have a question from Billy. When spring data is involved, can you discuss transactions and rollbacks at a high level? Um, when spring data is involved, yeah. I mean, at a higher level, dealing with transactions across these various microservices, in fact, Never mind talking about Spring Cloud Stream or anything like that. Just in general, talking about transactions as it pertains to microservices. Um, I, I, I'll be quite honest. I can't speak to it a, to a great deal other than to say you design your microservices such that they are eventually consistent. Um, and you don't necessarily have spanning transactions, although there are ways of doing that. There are still absolutely ways of doing that. Um, generally speaking, the idea is you design them such that they are eventually consistent with each other. You don't worry about them. Now, internally within each one of those, yes, transactions are just like if it was any other application. Uh, you use you know, the good old at transactional annotation and use some of the built-in uh, transactional support that Spring offers, but cross uh, microservice transactions are a whole different beast. And um, yeah, I, I can't speak to those to any great detail other than to say, you just generally design them so that it's okay uh, that this one thing does its job. And if another one fails to do its job, then it's that other one that needs to be reconciled, not, um, not this. So in this case, it, it's probably a bad example, but in this case, I may handle the payment, which now I've taken money from a customer, which may, may or may not be, it's good for me if I'm the, if I'm the, uh, the business, uh, but now I haven't booked the uh, customer's trip yet because maybe that the booking failed. Um, if that were the case, then, you know, the customer is going to be upset with me, but the idea is I would deal with that as a separate matter. And I would deal with the reconciliation of that. And eventually it would get booked, even if it's not booked automatically, um, because those are distinct things. Each are distinct problems that are being solved. They're related to each other in the concept of booking a trip, but they are distinct things. And so if, if one of them passes and the other one fails, then I, I reconcile it eventually. I don't necessarily have to deal with it in a transaction. And I think, you know, 
uh, one thing I've observed is that um, as, as, as developers, we get a little bit, we're, we're reasonably comfortable with the notion of decoupling our code, but um, we still struggle with decoupling our thought processes, or, or certainly I, I struggle with that because, you know, if I'm building a system, it's like, okay, there's this whole sequence that happens and it's really hard to kind of break that up and, 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 and get into this mindset where I don't care who's producing events and I don't care who's consuming events. I have one responsibility and it's do this. And, and so, you know, for example, if we go into the e-commerce, I, the, the e-commerce uh, use case, if you will, you know, somebody submits an order, that's an event, right? Um, you know, and, 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 and something picks that up and, and maybe it updates inventory or maybe charges the credit card. Uh, the credit card charging is an event. So we update the inventory now because somebody has like got that lock on there and oops, we don't have something. Now that's just another event. And so, so like when I think of an event driven system, my rollback is not something where I'm trying to like chain all these things together uh, in, in like a, a saga or anything like that. I want to just say, oh, there's a problem here. We need to, uh, I just emit an event that there's a problem and, and my little module is done with it. Something else is going to pick that up and then make the adjustments and, and kind of follow its own process. But it's a, it's a difficult mind shift and I don't know, I don't know if that helps or not, or if I'm even making any sense. And, and that's a really good explanation. Another thing that I, I thought of while you were talking is I didn't necessarily do this very well in my example, but there is a, the notion of designing your events such that they can be undone. And mm -hmm. so, for example, the example, I think it was Martin Fowler wrote it. I don't remember. Maybe it was him, maybe somebody else. They wrote the idea if, you're, if your job is to add numbers together uh, and to keep a count, the idea is not necessarily to say, here's my new cut, my new total, and that's your event, because then you, how do you roll back if you don't know what the original was? So instead you say, add this number. You can always mm -hmm. roll back an add. You can't roll back a new total. Um, and so, it, because you've, you'll have lost context of what the original total was. And so you, if you can design your, uh, your events such that they are undoable, then that's gonna help you a little bit when it comes to dealing with uh, you know, cross, uh, event transactions. But do you think undoable events are anathema to event-driven architectures? Not uh, really. I just think they're a, a means by which you can deal with those problems when they happen. Um, well, let me, let me throw an example of, of kind of the way I think of event, event, event sourcing and event-driven architectures uh, as, as two kind of complementary concepts. It's like a ledger in an, you know, an accounts ledger that, that, that uh, there is there's an expression in accounting and bookkeeping that accountants use pencil or pens, not pencils, that you never erase something, you just make an adjustment. Exactly, and that's kind of what I'm saying here, is you, you, would, you would not necessarily undo it just because it failed, you would have another event that un is able to undo it. You would, you, you would know how to create the event that adds to the ledger that undoes what you did before. Yeah. That the that the effect is that you've undone it. The truth is you have a new event, and and you and, and different properties emerge out of that approach as well. Uh, you know, I, I watched a uh, a great lecture a while back, uh, a great talk on event sourcing, and 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 the speaker asked the question, like if I'm if I'm building this e-commerce system, I'm treating things as an event. If I add product one, add product two, add product three, remove product two. Is that the same as add product one, add product three? And and the answer, of course, is it depends because when uh, because that the fact that they added and removed that, if you just did an undo there, you lose fidelity on some on some useful insights. So what are the things people are putting in their cart and then taking back out, for example? But uh, we can you can you order a pizza with extra cheese and then cancel the pizza but still get the extra cheese? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Um, oh, there's another question here from Mac. So Google supports PubSub capability in its cloud. Any comments on applying this to any of anything on GCP? I got to be honest with you. I know so very little about GCP other than the fact that I've deployed a few Lambda type uh, functions out there and I use it for hosting some just very simple HTTP sites. That's all I know about GCP. Um, but yeah, I wish I could answer you better on that, but I, I just don't know. 
Yeah, I can, I can, I can certainly speak to um, uh, like the event bus and 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 similar capabilities in Azure, uh, MSK, Confluent Cloud. But uh, I don't think I've even so much as logged into GCP ever. So we've got a few more questions coming in. Can we use these message-driven beans as part of Pulsar Lambda transformer functions or Pulsar topics? Um, help me out. What's Pulsar? I'm, I'm sorry to uh, expose my ignorance, but what's Pulsar? I, I too am going to have to bing this. Uh, well, because I use bing, I have nothing relevant. Okay, so Pulsar is sort of like Kafka. So it's another. I'm going to use. I'm going to. I'm going to abuse the word Kafka for a moment, and I'm going to be beat up by people who know Kafka really well. But if you're thinking of Kafka the same way you think of Rabbit as a message broker, um, then I am not aware of. I'm not aware of an implementation, a binding implementation for Pulsar. There may be one I'm not aware of, but uh, I do know it is possible to create your own binders. So even, even if Spring Cloud Stream doesn't provide its uh, a Pulsar binder, even if uh, there's not a, you know, some community uh, uh, project out there that provides one for you, uh, I do know it's possible to create your own bindings. I've never done that just because I haven't needed to, but uh, I do know it's possible to do so. Oh, so there's a comment here expanding on uh, what Pulsar is. Take the best parts of Kafka and expand on them to solve problems that were out of scope of Kafka's original design. Ease of scalability, particularly in large organizations with multiple segments of users, natively supports, wow, multi-tenant CG replication. This is good to know because I'm trying to build a multi-tenant Kafka cluster right now. Uh, Role-based access control, segregation of billing, tiered storage model, uses bookkeeper and zookeeper. Um, interesting. So, well, yeah. if it is... If it is uh, as good as Jonathan says, um, uh, somebody is probably going to beat you to having to build that custom right. custom binder. I mean, if it is still a Kafka under the covers, then it's possible that it just works. Uh, you may not be able to take advantage of those those new features, but if it's if it's like Kafka but not Kafka, uh, then yeah, you'll probably need a custom binding. And so probably somebody else has done it already, or if not, you could do it yourself. That might be a fun open source project for you to start. Yeah. Uh, and I, I'm not I'm not doing a lot of spring right now. Otherwise, this is something that I'd probably just play with. It'd be a fun little fun little thing to throw out there. So uh, yeah, apparently this is basically what's in the 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 marketing materials. But uh, uh, never never the the person who shared this, uh, Jonathan, has never actually used it. But that's that's interesting and good to know. Yeah. Uh, and. And we're a little over the top of the hour. I want to see if we can get one more question in here. Oh, Ravi uses Pulsar heavily. Um, and overstock. Oh, cool. Interesting. Yeah. You never heard of it until today. I know. I got. I, well, that's that's that that that's the problem with with um, hanging out with the the entire NoFluff community. Whether it's the speakers, whether it's the attendees, uh, I have never left even a session without having to go away with, you know, and do a lot of research. And that's, that's what I love. And that's why I'm looking forward to, to getting back into this. I know I'm planning on, on, on being at a lot of the, 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 the live events that are scheduled later this year. I'm getting, um, uh, you know, I, I will be, I will be fully vaccinated soon as many of us will be and uh, looking forward greatly to that, but do check out nofluffjuststuff.com If you want to register for Craig's half day workshop on this topic, uh, it is uh, it, it is a great opportunity to uh, to spend the morning with the master and uh, uh, and 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 get some more tools in your toolbox. Uh, of course, there's a whole lot of these. There's a whole whole selection of these. All of these are at nofluffjustup.com. You can catch the replay there. You can sign up for future webinars and uh, and check out all of the great events that are coming up here soon. Uh, one other question here came in from earlier. Any tries of SC functions on Riff? Uh, I've, I've only tinkered with Riff early on, so I don't know a ton about it. But ultimately, Spring Cloud function and Riff were kind of born at the same time. And Riff was sort of, Riff was, the best way I could describe it is Riff was to Spring Cloud functions what uh, Spring Cloud Dataflow is to Spring Cloud Stream. Um, so, if you're talking about Spring Cloud Function, yes, I don't see any reason why it wouldn't work on Riff because it ultimately at the it begin end of the day it was at least originally it was the same developers working on them. Um, I don't know if that's still true or not. Um, so 
I don't see why it wouldn't work. I just, I just don't know. Uh, I haven't done much with Riff other than tinker with him when it was first announced a few years ago. All right on. Well, I think at this point we're going, oh, there's uh, one more here. It came in late because of time zone confusion. Is the recording being shared? Yes. Uh, it will be online probably relatively shortly after we stop broadcasting. So check in in a couple hours. And, and once again, all of these are on nofluffjuststuff.com. So thank you so much, folks. Have a great weekend. Uh, I know I know. for some people it's Good Friday. For others, every Friday is is a good Friday. Uh, so So whatever your whatever your observations and, and beliefs and everything else, have a wonderful Friday, have a wonderful weekend and look forward to seeing you online again soon and in person in due course. I thank you. <laughs>